great to welcome all of you to our um, last book launch of the month of April. <laughs> Uli Baer is with us tonight. He's a professor of German and comparative literature and also vice provost for faculty, arts, humanities, and diversity here at NYU. Um, since he's probably often introduced in administrative contexts, I'm going to do a non-administrative context introduction uh, and just speak about Uli's really remarkable um, scholarship and, and teaching. Um, he did his PhD at Yale in a, in a record four years uh, after getting his BA from Harvard and then a year later joined the faculty here at NYU in 1996. Um, and in addition to his many administrative duties, he's been remarkably productive as a scholar and has also been an exemplary teacher, um, as noted by his NYU's Golden Dozen Awards. He's won a Getty Fellowship, a Humboldt Fellowship, and a Guggenheim. And his many books include Remnants of Song, Trauma and the Experience of Modernity in Charles Baudelaire and Paul Celan, Spectral Evidence, The Photography of Trauma, uh, the edition of 110 Stories, New York Writes After September 11th, and Das Rilke Alphabet, uh, originally in German in 2006. With Emily Sun and Eyal Peretz, he co-edited The Claims of Reading, the Shoshana Fellman Reader with Fordham. Uh, he's also a translator, Letters on Life, The Wisdom of Rana Maria Rilke um, in 2005, which itself has been translated into Portuguese, German, and Greek. And most recently, uh, he has appeared as a writer of short stories, uh, with the Baker's Chicken Stories from Shanghai, which came out last year. And I just want to conclude by saying it's a pleasure to welcome Uli here to the HI, where he's been a frequent participant over the years in our events, on, and on at least two occasions, uh, a recipient of some of our funding. Uh, I want to give a special mention. No, I, this, this continues. Um, because uh, one of my favorite team taught courses ever, and I'm so happy that the other team member, Shelley Rice, is here tonight, was a course on archives, photography, and cultural memory. I think you guys were our first uh, funded team uh, teaching pair, and you really set an extremely high bar for everyone to come after you. So I love trotting out your course and you know the archive that is still online and talking about the many things you did. So it's in that context that I mention that. Um, but the other context in which I mention that is that we are very, very pleased here at the HI to have also contributed uh, to the publication of the translation of Das Rilke Alphabet in the Rilke Alphabet, published with Fordham University Press earlier this spring. Uh, that's why we're here tonight. Um, it's really, to me, one of the most bracing works in literary scholarship and creativity that I've read in a long time, and a real honor and privilege to be uh, sitting next to Uli as he will now talk to us about his book. So, Well, Uli thank Bear. you, Jane, and thank you, everybody, for coming on this beautiful spring day. <laughs> uh, lovely weather. Um, there are two copies here. Maybe if you can circulate these because you should look at the index, flip through. I will speak for about 20 minutes and then entertain some questions, maybe some comments or responses. And I'll tell you a little bit about context of why I spent a decade of my life reading Rilke, probably a little more than that. Why I tried, to, why I wrote this book, this particular book, how it's constructed because it's a very different format from a typical work of literary criticism, I believe. Um, and I'll give you two or three examples of the chapters that I tried to write. This is a book that's supposed to be read not in sequence. You can pick up any essay and read the essay that interests you. It's about 26 words that don't quite make obvious sense in Rilke. And one of my questions was when you read poetry and there's a word that doesn't quite work in the context or sort of stops you in your thinking or makes you think about another context, how is that How is that actually one of the fundamental ways in which we use ordinary language to say extraordinary things, which is to use ordinary language to write poetry. So the context is that Rilke, I approached Rilke probably not quite as a German poet because he isn't a German poet. Uh, he was born in Prague in 1875 and he grows up in this multilingual community as a German speaker, minority speaker of German like Kafka who he meets at some point later on, uh, same milieu, and he moves to Paris uh, when he's around 20, 25. So by 1900, he's in Paris. And this is very important. So Rilke is the poet for me who is at the cusp of our modernity, and he's really has the affectations of a late romantic poet. But he's a very modern poet in the following sense, that he promises us something through poetry, that there is something greater, something beyond our own humanity that is not rooted in ideology, not rooted in religion, and not rooted in transcendence. 
not rooted in ideology, which is going to be one of the major magnetic forces and disasters of the 20th century, that big ideological movements will give people a sense that there's something greater than themselves. So you have to look at Rilke as a poet who is promising us there's something beyond the human, but this is located within us. It is also not located within religion. And you hear dealing with a Europe that's slowly being disenchanted or let's say um, religion is losing its sway over people and ideology maybe sweeps in. So in this larger context, Rilke makes this promise that there's something imminent in us and yet greater than ourselves. And to give you sort of the, this is the spectrum of Rilke's work. So he moves to Paris. He's um, an incredibly gifted poet, a little too gifted for his own good. Uh, in his early 20s, he produces an enormous amount of poetry that's really well put together. It's, uh, it's, it rhymes to a point of sort of to a fault. There's lots of internal rhyming, all these words, these assonances. And Lou Andreas Salome, who becomes the first woman to become a psychoanalyst under Freud's tutelage, who is his lover when he's 20, she's 36, says, Rilke, you're a really good writer, but you rhyme too much. Your handwriting is terrible. Your name is too effeminate because his name is Rene. So she gives him a new name, says your name should be or shall be Reiner from now on, and you should not rhyme so much, and you should actually be a little bit more serious about yourself because you're just using all this talent to spew out things. So you have this poet who's actually incredibly gifted, and he's putting himself through this very difficult and disciplined regimen of learning how to be an artist. He becomes Auguste Rodin's assistant, famously. Some of Most of you probably know this. And this is where I'll talk for a minute or two about the principle behind this work here. So what I try to do, and Rodin is very important here, to single out a few details in Wilke's work that seem a bit incongruous, seem that struck me as odd or interesting, problematic, somewhat scandalous in some ways, um, and that I read and sort of traced through the entire herb, through all the poetry, all the prose, and all the letters that I could read. So I don't. I think I read maybe between nine and twelve thousand letters by Rilke. Um, I read all the poetry many, many times. I read the unpublished poems. A lot of it is actually, you know, it's, there's French poetry. There are lots of translations. He was a good translator, actually, from Italian and French into German. And I used every single detail that I found interesting to look at the entire oeuvre and sort of try to find a way to say how one detail in a work can actually explain to you the entire work. Um, this is what Rilke took from Rodin, whose sculptures work very much with the details of the surface. There are sometimes these kind of rough surfaces, and one little aspect of one <coughs> figure's um, elbow is actually supposed to reveal the essence and the greatness of this individual. So Rodin was very much interested in surfaces. Rilke is also very much interested in surfaces. Rilke starts writing um, the poems that he's um, rightly famous for, um, by going to the zoo in Paris. And I'll start there because this will be the first chapter in this book. He goes to the zoo because Rodin is very tired of this sycophantic, German-speaking artist wannabe who sort of somehow talked his way into becoming his personal assistant. And, do his, and Rodin says, go and leave. Go, go, go to the zoo and look at some things because you have no, you can't, you're not seeing anything. You're just writing and you don't see. You, don't, you haven't learned how to see. You also haven't learned how to work. So Wilke goes and comes right back, and then Rodin says, no, 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 go again and spend a couple hours looking at a hydrangea or a panther or a flamingo or a gazelle. And so Rilke will actually start to try to understand how to describe something in its appearance to us without attributing greater meaning to it, but just to focus on the appearance to us. So it's a kind of phenomenology of poetry, in a sense. And this is, you know, in the spirit of the time, that's actually what's being born here. This is when Husserl is writing. This is when phenomenology comes out. So there's a background. He goes to the zoo in Paris, and in the poems that come out of this, very famous in the new poems on the Book of Images, the Panther is probably the most famous one for most people, the Carousel, um, he meets a group of West Africans who are exhibited in a cage and called the Ashanti, who are just a couple Africans being exhibited in Paris at the zoo in 1902. This was standard in Europe from the roughly 1870s um, till the 1920s. Uh, it happened in the Bronx Zoo right here. The American Zoo exhibited an African for a couple of years who then lived in that zoo and was called a pygmy. And I was interested in this encounter because there wasn't much done in this, and it was... It, troubled me 
So he's writing all these beautiful poems about flamingos, night rangers, and I'd been always fed this idea that Rilke is such a wonderful, aesthetic, beautiful poet, and then he writes about these Africans in a cage. So this poem becomes very interesting because what happens in this poem is one would expect the people in the cage look back at Rilke. So there's a return of a gaze. So I tried to analyze out of this one little poem, uh, which has not been discussed very much, of what is at stake in his project of seeing. So that's one example in which I used one word and said the word Ashanti, how does that word figure in his poetry to say, okay, there's the entire aesthetic is at stake here. And can it be sustained? Does it work? So this would be one way to open up his poetic project from one word that if you overread this word, if you ignore this poem, if you somehow make some kind of excuse or apology or say this is in the culture and context of what Europe is going through, a lot of people are dealing with this. Um, you don't quite do justice to Rilke. So a lot of my effort was to actually take Rilke seriously as a poet. So he wrote this poem, so you have to read this poem. So I felt it wasn't a way to just sort of carve out some space and say, problematic, the European racist imagination, some another form of Orientalism, and we can sort of move on. He said, let me stay right here and try to develop from here. What is he actually trying to do? So all the essays in this book come from these encounters of words that don't quite make sense. Um, so the methodology is to come, go from individual details in a poem, one word, and then open up from this one word everything. This is actually the quote I used for the um, preface of this book, uh, because Rilke thought he was a secretary of the invisible, as Heidegger very famously quotes him, and he's, he's writing down what we cannot see, which is not some mystical transcendent thing, but something actually that we live in. And he writes, the longer I live, the more urgent it seems to me to endure and transcribe the whole dictation of existence. And das ganze Diktat des Daseins, which is really great because it's a kind of stenographer. It's a very modernist way. This is somebody who's living in 1900 when mod, you know typewriters, the telephone, telegraph, all these things are being you know becoming more commonplace. Das ganze Diktat des Daseins, the whole dictation of existence. And then he uses the word Dasein, which becomes the kind of linchpin of a lot of Heideggerian philosophy. He wants to write, transcribe the whole dictation of existence up to its end. For it might just be the case that only the very last sentence contains that small and possibly inconspicuous word which transforms into magnificent sense everything we had struggled to learn and everything we had failed to understand. So if you, t if you take that seriously, I thought that little tiny word that we don't really want to know about. And by we, I mean us as readers who actually are engaging with somebody who's writing, uh, a poet who, for me, charts a possibility of being human in the 20th century that does not get seduced by ideology or religion or some greater belief system. Um, and there's something in every word that could contain the key to that. It's a kind of, you know, it's a kind of, uh, it's, it exists in many traditions, this idea that there's one word that has the key to everything. Um, so I looked at these words. Uh, some of the words I looked at also um, were words that interested me because not they didn't make sense, but they made a little too much sense. So Ashanti is one of those words, actually, because there's an entire network of questions that comes around that. And so I put that in the context of other people who wrote about Africans being exhibited in Vienna. They are very famous writers, very famous examples. Um, and some other words I looked at is the word uh, Buddha, for example. Um, this is partly in a kind of very subtle and long ago response. So I was very fortunate that Hel Bloom once blurbed my translat translation of Rilke's letters. So I had this great experience of sending my manuscript to Harold Bloom. And her he received the manuscript, and I had to reconstruct all of this. He must have received it in New Haven, let's say, let's assume, early in the morning. So he faxes me around 2 p.m. So he had about two hours to read the whole manuscript. <laughs> and he said something really interesting. And he said, Rilke is almost Asian in his difference from Goethe, Nietzsche, Freud. Then he goes into some very complex thing about, the, about suffering and something that Shane has worked on a lot with Italian mystical women poets who fall in love and then keep on loving when the subject of their love completely rejects them. It's a very important concept, so I'll talk about love and death in, in a minute. So the Buddha becomes an important figure for Rilke, and he writes several Buddha poems. And when he was living on Rodin's estate, there was a m huge Buddha figure right in front of his little house. Um, so I looked at that, and then I read, since I read a lot of letters, uh, his wife gave him the texts of Gautama Buddha, which were translated into German in 1902 in Neumann's translation, very important translation, the first translation from uh, the original Sanskrit and Pali into a Euro Western European language becomes a really important book. 
in the sense that Husserl has this book, Einstein has this book, Thomas Mann has this book. Einstein says, this is the only book I took when I emigrated. Thomas Mann says, this is the one book I couldn't dispense with. Husserl says, this book changed my life. So all these major writers are getting this Buddha book, and this is the first time sort of the encounter. I mean, Schopenhauer had assimilated you know, Buddhism into Western philosophy, but there's a moment when something is marked. And Rilke gets this book and writes to his wife, I, I got the book and I opened it, and I looked at it and I closed it with a shudder immediately. Uh, because he recognized himself in this book. So I make a lot about this kind of encounter where he encounters the Buddha, and then he says to Rodin, also I see this Buddha outside of my window, and then I close my window and write my poetry. So it's a kind of turning into this. And then the Buddha poems are all about looking at the statues of the Buddha and trying to see whether the materiality of those statues is a way to understand the Buddha and not to see some deeper meaning into that, there's some essence into that, to look past what we see, to look past our world, for it's all a project of being imminent in the world. So some of these words are like that. So as I said, some are um, scandalous, I don't know. Um, there's an M for Mussolini, which ended up being a rather long chapter because Rilke for a moment was really infatuated with Mussolini. In 1926, early summer, a lot of people are infatuated with Mussolini at this point. Uh, a lot of poets, a lot of statesmen, people who later on will recognize that Mussolini is not good news for Europe or for Italy. And Rilke thinks it's great news. He says, finally, someone has a really muscular language and can actually c contain all the confusion and misdirection in Italian culture into one kind of into a rhetoric that actually people get moved by. And what I liked about this uh, incident is that then this woman, Aurelia Galarati Scotti, who is just a Park Avenue wife, really rich, hedge fund manager husband. You have to imagine people like that. I mean, she is just, you know, Gucci all the way, wonderful rich lady, and, you know, has patrons, and she's a patron of the arts, so she knows Wilke. So she writes to him and says, you get this entirely wrong. You have no idea what you're talking about. Italian culture is very different. This is monstrous and murderous, and Mussolini is all about violence. And the interesting thing for me was that Wilke actually stands corrected by somebody who is no stature in the literary philosophical world, that he actually paid attention to people and listened to them when they corrected him. So I was interested in this exchange of how would it take this kind of poet who's been trying to think for 50 years about how to use language to actually be in the world to take some socialite, wealthy woman, to tell him you are completely wrong, and he says, you're right, I'm wrong. So I analyzed this kind of change, and it doesn't do away with the fact that you like Mussolini. And I have a friend who said, don't tell me this. I don't want to know this about Rilke. So I think, well, you have to live with you know, Rilke the way he was. And then there's two other aspects sort of on the spectrum of what I try to do. If he promises us something beyond our humanity, what do I mean by that? So the two experiences that Rilke talks about throughout his poetry are the experience of falling in love and the confrontation and counter our awareness of death. Um, so, and he has, this, he has these really beautiful descriptions of falling in love. And then one of my entries is on Gaspar Stampa, who is one of Jane's, you know, um, women who are, <laughs> and I loved all these women to a point because Rilke loves these women who have become mystical poets. Um, there's a whole series of them who fall in love usually with some knight or some nobleman or something. And then this guy, the way guys are wont to do, as Rilke writes in his letters to a young poet, men, have, men haven't even read the first primer on love. They just have no idea how to love. Women actually know something about that. So he keeps on saying men are not sophisticated enough. So these men commence this kind of affair but never really consummate, and then they move on. And these women keep on loving. And they keep on loving, sort of burning through the object of their desire and keeping on loving and actually elevating themselves into a state of being that is actually more than what they could be. And what Rilke is trying to get to is when all of you know this, when you have a crush on somebody, um, you know, intellectual, romantic, erotic, whatever it is, you know, and there's those things happen if you're lucky. Uh, at that moment, you try to be a little more than what you are. Not in the simplistic sense, I'm trying to impress that person and look really good today or something like that, but you actually try to live up to yourself as the greatest possible you you could be because you want to encounter that person also as the greatest possible person that person is. So this is what Rilke says happens in the experience of loving somebody, that you actually elevate yourself to a place that you didn't quite know before because in this encounter with the other person, you're transformed. And then he says in one of the elegies, 
quite nicely that this is what happens when you fall in love and occasionally actually maybe that's reciprocal, not in the case of Gaspar Ostampa and uh, all these other women. But what happens then, you encounter the other person and then he says, which is the interesting thing to me that he's always so concrete, says then you see the other person and that person blocks your view of something greater. Because you're so in love with this face, this person, this, but that person is then so much in the way. So this kind of movement towards something greater is actually also stopped by that other encounter. Um, part of the object of this book was a really uh, minor claim that I tried to prove that Rilke had a body. Uh, and Rilke, who is the poet of angels and unicorns and maidens and carousels and hydrangeas, <laughs> as I said, uh, had an enormous amount of lovers throughout his life. All these amazing women got a lot of criticism for that from people like Bertolt Brecht, Thomas Mann. They really were incredibly envious that this poet who writes poetry for adolescent girls is so popular, so successful, that women really respect him. He's a really a feat poet for them, for their masculine center. I mean, Brecht makes his career writing about boxing, you know, in the beginning of his career. But they're... And then Brecht says something really <coughs> profound and really amazing about Wilke also. He says, the category of the genius is a bourgeois invention, except in the case of Wilke. <laughs> who, so in this idea of love, you become more than yourself. That's the one thing. And then the other thing is in the experience of death. Wilke, like a lot of people, um, I mean, I, had, I was you know, privileged last week. I took part in a lot of conversations about James Baldwin. James Baldwin writes essentially the same thing in the 60s. And he says, our culture is obsessed with suppressing the fact of death. That actually, not just our own mortality, but the fact that death is all around us, people will die. We just, as a Western culture, we actually pri we take a huge amount of pain to deny that fact. And then Wilke has nice things to say, such as, there's a rusty nail sticking out, rejoicing in the fact that it will bring someone death, because that's its purpose in the world, to be this rusty nail. And this is the purpose of this nail, and this nail has a purpose in the world. So he has these really strange things to say about death. And then he also has really um, consoling things to say, and the greatest letters that he wrote were letters of condolence, uh, where literally he would say, dear so-and-so, and he would launch into this very deep reflection of what it means to be alive. And uh, the, the basic gist of all these letters is, it is an obligation for us to live our lives. It is a great failure not to live your life fully. And he takes out of this, this encounter with this, this kind of um, imperative to be as alive as we can be. Um, <coughs> I said he has a body. He writes a lot of erotic poetry. He goes into uncomfortable detail sometimes the morning after, thinking how he prepares for the night before and what he does. And there's a lot of detail of that. And you kind of think, OK, this is. Um, and, the German publisher is making quite some money with that because every couple of years they release a few more letters that are erotic <laughs> letters by Wilke, <laughs> as if nobody knew. There's a whole section of poems. There's a whole category called the phallic poems. And Wilke sees none of, there's no contradiction for him. There's an actually sexuality and eros and death and the way we can be bigger is one thing for him. So he's trying to do that. Having said all this, then in 1926, Wilke is very sick and he's, he has leukemia, it's an infection. Uh, he's very reluctant to have a doctor come. He had refused psychoanalysis in 1913. He met Freud several times, and he says, I don't trust psychoanalysis because it'll probably scare away my demons but also frighten the angels in me. So he said, I can't have that compromise, so I'd rather live with my neuroses, essentially. So 1926, he's dying, and he, the only person he wants to see at this point is Lou Andrea Salome. Um, and he writes her this letter, and he writes a poem about actually where he is in pain, and he says, in my entire life, I've tried to integrate death into life. Every poem I've written has tried to make sense of that, that death is in life, and I've absolutely failed. I'm in so much pain. It is consuming me, and I'm burning up in myself. And there's this failure, this acknowledgment of failure, which is actually then becomes this incredible poem. And there's a, you could read this as a kind of the sublation of this, and so he sublimates it into this, and a lot of this book is... I think, on a very hidden level, writing against Freud's theory of sublimation, but I don't really footnote anything, so I just sort of have this <laughs> place going. But he fails. And part of what he's saying, we always fail. We fail in love, we fail in acknowledging death, we fail in, we fail in all these things, and yet we try. So this is what the, what the 
the poetry is trying to do. Um, I'll give you two more examples of the kind of how the detail can sort of illuminate maybe the whole. So there's a word, uh, E is for entrails. And so when, uh, when he's 1904, I believe, no, it must be early 1901, he meets his future wife, um, who's a sculptor. And they meet in this colony, this northern German colony for painters. And he spends a couple of months there in the summers. And he's, and he's not from Germany, so it's a very sort of different country for him. And he meets these two pa this painter on the sculpture. And he falls in love with the painter. But then the painter already has a boyfriend, so he falls in love with the sculptor and marries Clara Rilke. That lasts for two or three years. They have a child, Ruth, who is raised by the grandparents because both parents, Rilke and his wife, go to Paris to become artists. And Paula Modersen Becker then dies in childbirth a couple of years later. Very tragically, his first child, and she dies, and she was a very gifted artist. And he writes this requiem for her, and it's a very famous requiem, sort of this poem, and it's, a, it's an elegy for somebody who he was very close to, really in love with this artist. And the elegy is really a ghost story, and he keeps on writing that he's being haunted by her ghost, which becomes this image, but also this is how he experiences it, that he cannot let go of this woman and the memory of her. So he writes this, and then he, he writes how he's trying to sort of respond to this ghost and his presence, and she keeps on inhabiting him. And then ultimately, it, the poem ends in a place where he talks about his intestines and the noise they make, and which is this onomatopoetic boy, uh, it's word in German called queren, which is not a word that anybody uses at all for this, and it's a word that doesn't even sound German. And I taught this uh, um, a couple of years, a long time ago in a seminar at NYU, and someone, s um, someone said, this is not a word in German. And then the people who didn't speak German said, well, what is it? And they said, well, it's not German. It's some other word he made up. And I said, well, if it's in a Rilke poem, it's German, right? Because Rilke is a German poet. So I was interested in how, how, what does a word do in a poem that doesn't make sense in that poem? And what he was trying to do, I think, to get to this level where it's no longer a metaphor. It's no longer standing in for something else. It's just the pain in your intestines. That is what mourning is. It's that physical pain. And there's a couple incidents in, in these works. Another word is the word worm which I trace through from the novel, Malta Laboratory Brigade, to a couple of the other texts and a couple of the letters, um, which shows up in these really strange places. And I think it's one of the words that cannot be sublimated or turned into a metaphor for something else. It's just a worm. It can be cut up. And uh, he has this kind of great, at the end of this prose uh, novel, The Notebook of Malta Laboratory Brigade, he talks about kind of the prodigal son, and he becomes a shepherd, and he's sort of dealing with God and all this stuff, but then he's crawling along like a little worm in the universe, and there's something that it takes it all back to this very physicality of existence. So I try to um, write a book that would open up this work, um, as I said on Facebook yesterday, which amused people greatly, that Wilke inspired readers from Martin Heidegger, who in 1926, when Wilke passed away, took a week off from proofreading being in time with Husserl to read Rilke poems. I don't know any of you who would take off a day from anything because somebody passed away. You know, when Marquez died four weeks, did anybody stop and spend a week reading this <laughs> oeuvre? So this is the significance of a poet at the moment. He has this hold over the imagination of intellectuals. So from Heidegger to, then there's, um, I'll give you two more anecdotes that I actually like and they're illustrative of something. I don't mean them to be to trivialize Rilke at all. So Marlene Dietrich is on the beach in Venice in the early 30s and she's reading a book. And Eric Maria Remar comes by and says, what is a blonde woman like you doing with a book? And she says, I actually know the whole book by heart and I can show you in the hotel. So then they go to the hotel and she recites all of Rilke and they have this great affair. So this is actually nice. It's very Rilkean <laughs> to me. So I like that and then... Um, so maybe I'll stop right here. And I didn't mean to trivialize this at all. Actually, it's, it's what, it, what Rilke did for me. I started out so, um, you know, not in a good way. I translated Rilke first because at my father's funeral, I needed to read something. And I had a passage from the letters, which I translated. And I kept on translating. And it got me through a place where I thought the quote I translated said, when you lose somebody, you are left with a hundredfold responsibility of the things that this person couldn't accomplish. And you are pressed more deeply into life. And for me, this sentence was very hard to understand because I felt it actually lifted you out of life in the way in which you actually are not quite in the world when you lose someone. You are sort of removed from the world. You are detaching. 
And Wilke says, no, no, you're more, you're pressed more deeply into it. Um, and so I translated this paragraph, and then I kept on translating Rilke for a year or so and translated a lot of letters and passages I liked. So the work comes out of this place to sort of say, how can actually literature lead you into something rather than take you out of something? Um, two other things that I, uh, it's a work of translation, as Jane said. Um, and then I rewrote, I believe, eight chapters or something like that because the German words didn't, commence with the same letter as the English word, which I didn't like because being German and sort of had to be accurate. So I had to rewrite <laughs> all these essays. And the late Holland Tarda, who really has to be acknowledged here, who was instrumental in getting this book published, and as some of you know, was the editor at Fordham University Press, who passed away about 10 weeks ago, was so invested in this project and said, I love the idea of doing these chapters. I love the idea of doing no footnotes. And she really got something. and. What I shared with Helen was that I do martial arts and she did martial arts for a long time, this kind of being in the world and trying to be more awake in the world. That's what she saw in this book. So I wrote this book out of these um, encounters with people who I really felt shared this kind of understanding that Wilke can give us in the world. Um, so it's a translation. Um, it's me writing in English, which is, so I write in English sometimes and then I write in German sometimes. Um, and the other part that was important for me that Rilke is a, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, he's an unusual poet because um, he often writes in a woman's voice. Um, and that's kind of an interesting project in itself to actually sort of undo certain kind of categories. So um, maybe I'll stop and people have questions and I want to get more wine. And um, the book's also not just a sculpture outside, but it is for sale. and. Tom doesn't want to lug it all back up, so if you want to look at this, so look at the uh, the entries, and you can ask me anything you want. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and, and, and maybe I'll just kick off with a with a question or two. Um, Uli, as you mentioned, that your book has no footnotes. Did the German edition have footnotes? Not really. No, okay. very few. It has a couple. It has about ten footnotes, I think. Maybe well, there's a few. Percent. They're they're not <laughs> noticeable. They're not noticeable. Let's, let's put no, it that way. No, no. Um, and and I guess since I'm not familiar with with Rilke scholarship, I was curious what you're pushing against in terms of your your reading. I, again, it's a reading without footnotes. It's a marvelously erudite and informed and I think in many ways generous and creative reading. But clearly there's 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 a Rilke industry out there. Uh, with which you're contending, and I'm wondering if you could just so say a little start, bit about that. So I had this visit from the Rilke Society people at some point, which <laughs> oh I dear. really thought was kind of interesting. So I had an appointment, and I have a lot of appointments in a day, and then people come in, and I, like, and I look at my calendar, like, who are you people? And they said, oh, we're from the Rilke Society. And I said, oh, it's taken a while. <laughs> and I was very sort of, sort of curious what they wanted from me, and they said, oh, we want you to come to this Rilke Society event. They have a Rilke Society, and they have these events every two years or something, and I said, what do you actually want from me? I said, I don't really know what you want from me. And said, well, you edited all this Rilke in German now, and so I've edited five editions of his letters in German, so I'm kind of there. And then I said, and what else? And I said, oh, yeah, and you wrote this other book, The Rilke Alphabet, and uh, found it really interesting. And I said, and anything else? And then they said, well, you know, could you? So they wanted me to talk about it, and I said, this is kind of, a new way of looking at Rilke. And I said, well, that's not entirely true. There have been some discussions on Rilke. It's been you know, discussed for a long time. But the industry is to preserve an image of a German poet who is actually relatively unsullied by the German catastrophe of the Holocaust, who actually in some ways dies early enough and in some ways promises, which I'm working against, this idea of sort of a greater life, transcendence, and sort of a kind of, for me, really wrong reading of Rilke is this idea that it's about how beautiful a flower can be and how it can transport you. This is not what it's about. This is about an honest and authentic, in a sort of pre Heideggerian mm -hmm. way, living. I said that is actually what Rilke is doing. He's pushing into life in a very concrete, mm -hmm. authentic way. That's why he also runs into trouble with some of these words. And mm -hmm. so the Rilke industry is preserving a quotable, serviceable Rilke who is who props up a kind of a cultural ideal, which he isn't even. He isn't even German, so in some ways, you know, he's sort of mm -hmm. in this other place. Um, it's also it's 
it's sanitized in the wrong way. I have nothing against sanitizing somebody and not talking about bio biography all the time because there is something distracting about it, but Rilke has this in his work. And Rilke said uh, in 1922, he writes this, this testament in Will, and he says, my letters are as important as all of my poetry, and I want my editor to publish your letters in the same editions. That never happens. So you're thinking in Germany, you think these German scholars would be so on top of that, and there would be one big edition with 55 volumes of Rilke letters. They're all over the place. They're all over the archives. There's occasionally things missing because they haven't included one or two. It, there's no coherent way of doing it. So in some way, I think they've tried to keep the life out of Rilke because it's threatening. And I don't mean politically threatening because actually it says, um, so I'll give you one more example. So there's, this collect there's an, um, an exchange of letters. He has this woman, Anita Forer, who is this 18-year-old woman in Switzerland who writes to him and says, dear Mr. Rilke, you're a famous poet. I love your poetry and I am in trouble because I've fallen in love with somebody and my parents are not so happy with it and they're sending me to a psychiatrist and the person I love happens to be a little bit older and she's a woman and what do I have to do because I read this poem, I read that poem. So Rilke writes 10 letters to her, these amazing letters for 1918. And he says really interesting things and he says, this could be the greatest experience of your life. It is a very important experience to take yourself seriously, take her seriously. Don't get distracted, however, by the erotic dimensions of this. He said they are part of it, but they will most likely distract you from what could happen here. So he kind of guides her through this experience, and then she becomes a very important person in Geneva, and she writes her memoirs, and in the late 40s they publish this book, and she's, she's married, has kids, she's a very you know, distinguished citizen. And she says, he actually gave me the courage to live my life, they want to live it. So he had these moments when he does something that actually is not entirely it's not accidental. He writes this because it's live your life the way you need to live it rather than um, in a kind of conformist way. So I think the Rilke industry is that. And then the Rilke industry is full of people who I didn't really want to climb those mountains. Those Heidegger and Paul de Man and Agamben and Blanchot. And I have sort of, I gave all of them one footnote, I think. I said, there's <laughs> Agamben. They philosophize Rilke. They actually say something really, they say ultimately Rilke's language itself goes close to the vicinity of being. And then Heidegger in his contest says that's what Hölderlin really does. Rilke tries to get there. Said, that's not what he's trying to get close to. He's trying to get to being small b, to being alive on this earth mm -hmm. rather than a greater transcendent idea. Mm -hmm. Transcendent idea. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit like Kafka. He's he's yes. And and yeah. are he and Kafka in the German literary tradition? Are they kind of aligned or not? No, I, I mean, I always think of Kafka as a real outsider, and, and Rilke, as you're saying, you know, Rilke is, is the heart of the German. I think for soul. some people, though, Rilke is a little too sweet and saccharine, and it rhymes so much, mm -hmm. right? For so you learn those poems, and you sort of they're really memorable because they're amazing. So you have them in your head a lot. So there's he's not the Kafka is sort of you know he's existential and. Mm -hmm. You know, Kafkaesque. He's telling us, you know, <laughs> you know, they're sort of like that, and then there's a kind of Kafka has gives more traction. Rilke uh -huh. sort of Rilke goes down easily, not after this book, I think, so easily. So part of that was, but I, I talked to Amy, who was uh, edited, helped me edit this book, and I said, this is this is a labor of love. I would be insane to write this about somebody who I didn't think really is part of my life. Mm -hmm. I do not write about anybody I don't like. I mean to spend that much time in someone's, in someone's work. So people think this is, a, this is a kind of piece of exposing secrets about Rilke. That's, that's part of what reading is. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Although the, the Rilke you present isn't always a, a likable No, not so much. Not always. Um, <laughs> I, I was kind of horror-struck by, um, <laughs> I forget which, uh, which letter we were on. I think it might have been um, Frogs. The Frogs one, yeah. Where you talk about his yeah. daughter, Ruth has her baby, you know, or Ruth is the baby, Ruth is born and 10 days later he's out of there. Yeah. And you, you know, you, you suggest He's a bad that father, you would think. He's a very bad father. So I open up this whole calculation in this chapter and I say, okay, he's a bad father, and at the end of the day we have his poetry. So his daughter, who actually makes her living ultimately editing all of Rilke's mm -hmm. letters and lives off that, which is fine, but still doesn't replace her father when she's a little kid. I said, what is this calculation? And I do this because he opens this every time because he's staying in some luxury hotel in Berlin for eight weeks and then he, the, the patron who's funding it says, I just got the bill. You stayed in the best hotel. It's like, as if you stayed at the St. Regis here for eight weeks. And said, you are a poet. And he says, absolutely. That's why I need to stay in this best hotel. <laughs> and so he, I mean, and he's, he's you know, he, he's mooching up everybody. I mean, he has all these rich people. And in some ways, mm. one of his greatest patrons the Princess Maria of you know, Turn and Taxes says, at the end of the day, who were we to give all this money and who's Rilke? 
he gave us Arduino allergies and we bought a bunch of, you know, jewelry and fur coats and country homes. So, so I tried to actually really, but I said, you can't really acquit him of having not mm -hmm. lived, spent any time with this kid. He doesn't go to her wedding because he's writing poetry. Mm -hmm. so. No, I mean, it, you know, on the one hand, you have this Rilke, who you very powerfully present as someone who keeps talking about the potential to live more than we already do. I mean, it's a, it's a wonderful way yeah. of thinking about his poetry, and, and, I, and I feel that it's, that it's right. But, you know, the ethics of that more, <laughs> are, I think you've really put into question. And, uh, but that's always the balance of this kind of being more awake. It ends up, mm -hmm. it's like, you know, New Age Buddhism in California and America. It be, it, it's a very easy way to jump into a completely selfish existence. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, I'm going to really focus on myself. That's not what, mm. you know. I mean, I had a we I had a Tibetan monk in our class with Shelley actually last semester, Rinpoche from Ladakh. And one of my students asked, goes, okay, when you've reached awareness, so when you've reached awareness as a Buddhist, are you really free from all these obligations and all these attachments and all these? I said, oh, he said, no, no, no. Then you've reached compassion. You're totally obligated to everyone. <laughs> And the student was so disappointed because he thought, oh, if I reach this, I'll be totally free. I can do what I want. He's like, no, no, no. Then you're no longer free. I really that is balancing this out. He sort of also wants to sometimes say, I'm free because I don't need to be dealing with these people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Well, there are some questions, so let me learn. Yeah. And we have a mic, so. Thank you both. Uh, I can only paraphrase this, and you'll know this, of course. Can you comment on that, that comment of Rilke's that not the purpose of life, but maybe the process of being is to continue to ask questions which are unanswerable or questions that are difficult mm -hmm. and to go beyond to each question that is more difficult. So this is, the, this is probably from the fourth letters to a young poet where he says, learn to live the questions, right? This quote but is... Also, but he also says each level of question should be more difficult and unattainable. Yes, yeah. The answer being unattainable. Well, that's probably too. That is kind of how you actually pull yourself forward. But learn to, basically learn to be comfortable yes. with those questions. Right. And don't be unsettled and don't strive to find an answer too early. Right, right. Which is especially advice to younger people. Sort of, you, you want to know everything. And he says, well, first of all, what you can impart to younger people, you'll never know everything. Although we live in the solution. And he says, le stay a little bit longer with the questions, I think. Hi. Uh, could you comment uh, on the notion of Weltinnenraum? Oh, I'm thinking here of Wallace Stevens' Inscape somewhat. I think he uses that term. Um, that would interest me. I actually, this chapter about the it's entrails. entrails, right? <laughs> the entrails, I have the whole chapter is devoted to that and said, what exactly yes. is world's inner space, which is one of these concepts that look, it's a nice German word world inner space one word so you you got it all um, and it's where people thought he ends up is in some kind of cosmic sort of larger connected sense of being at large and I think no he ends up in his physical condition of how he feels that day how this is actually I think it goes into something very concrete and the physicality of existence which is an embodied existence uh, and it's not something you know, so it's not an abstract philosophical concept. Of well, there, I, I, um, yeah, he knew some Nietzsche. He's not a philosophical thinker at all. Right. right. I went to a Joyce, and, and then Beckett has this great sentence, he says, about Rilke. Rilke has the fidgets, a disorder which may very well give rise, as it did with Rilke on occasion, to poetry of a high order. But why call the fidgets God, Ego, Orpheus, and the rest? This is a childishness to which German writers seem especially prone. <laughs> so this is Beckett sort of dismissing all of that again. And I'm saying, where does this go? Once you dismiss that, where are you going to be ending up? And then you end up where Beckett is, which is going nowhere and everywhere in language. So, but there are these writers who have this kind of investigation inward. Yeah. Yeah, my question is a little bit about the choice of words and why you didn't mm. choose a verb at all. Did I not choose a I verb? I don't think you chose a <laughs> verb. And as the reason why I think it's interesting is because for me, verbs are, ca are kind of the carrier of time. So yeah, that's interesting. I don't know. And uh, or action and movement and living in a way. So Partly probably because I, um, I do think the 
the books the books of poetry that are really important are the book of images these kind of these uh, because the the thing poems the ding gedichte sort of they become you know he invents the genre he perfects it in a way i think so these kind of that he looks at an object and sort of tries to just give you this object in language to recreate this object in language that's one of the ambitions so i think that's why i was sort of moved by that um i don't know i can i'm uh the only verb I can really think of is to be, because he insists so much this is the one obligation we have to be on this earth more fully than we are right now. This is sort of this kind of insistence on this deepening. But uh, I don't know. Yeah, I haven't. Okay. Yeah, interesting question. Yeah, yeah they're all nouns. They're except all nouns, for O, yeah. Y, and Un, <coughs> right. which are parts of speech. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. Maybe the could I mean, be. Or the undoing of all yeah. nouns. Yeah, um, this really has to do with your process of writing it. Um, you know, which letters were particularly difficult to find words mm -hmm. for? What was the last, because I assume you didn't do it A through Z. You know, I don't remember the last, but I, I'll tell you a, a sort of a little anecdote. So I, w I, um, I had the uh, fortune and misfortune of going to the gym with many colleagues, so you know how that is. So I, I came to the gym and I ran into Avital Ronell, who was a colleague of mine, and she knew I was writing. And, and I was really <laughs> despairing because I said, I only have 22 chapters. I'll never finish this book. I need four more letters. And she said, what are you missing? And I said, U, V, O, and I don't know the letter. And she said, O, oh, and then this is the chapter for O. <laughs> because an enormous amount of Rilke's poetry starts with O, where he really says O, oh, and this is actually so I, it's very important. It's actually a locution that's really central. You know, it's not some incidental, it's just put the letter, the word here. So I, I put this, so that got one chapter done. U, V, <laughs> X was very difficult. You know, X is uh, actually the middle name for Franz Xaver Kappus, who is the poet to whom you write letters to a young poet, which is a book that I also grew up with, like hundreds of millions of other people. Um, y was really difficult, um, and then I found a letter where he talks about the letter Y. So I thought, oh, yes, there's a Y here, so that's going to go. So, th so those were really hard, and the other ones, um, I wrote Ashanti first. That was the first thing I wrote, and I just kind of wrote it because I was sort of, you know, upset by it, I think. Then I wrote Buddha, I wrote God, I wrote Jew Boy, which is what somebody, not Wilke, calls Franz Werfel, and it's this kind of anti-Semitic moment, and he negotiates us in a kind of clumsy way, and I sort of talked about what this means, really, in the context of this. Uh, Stampa, because um, Gaspar Stampa is such an important figure, these women who can sublimate their love into something greater. This becomes one category for him of loving beyond the object. So some of them were just obvious to me. And then I didn't then think what other S word. I was just like, this is what I have to say. You know, this is the word here. So they got kind of fell into place like that. But it was a, fortunately, a kind of relatively brief moment when I was really panicked. I couldn't finish this book. <laughs> so, and I wrote it very fast, actually. I mean, I'd read so much Rilke. I felt I just sort of was pulling stuff in more than um, looking around. And then I didn't read a lot of criticism. Mm -hmm. uh, at that point anymore. The criticism is very odd. Now it's, it's gonna go through its way, but it was very existentialist, 50s and 60s. Mm -hmm. Then it becomes really political, sociological criticism, and they get really upset, and they say, look, he's either a proto-fascist, or he's a proto-Marxist, and one chapter is actually on the word proletarian because he calls Jesus Christ a proletarian at some point, which I like. Um, so they put him into these kind of political categories, and this is, I think, actually German scholars working out the division of Germany, essentially. Sort of there's Marxist East Germany, there's mm -hmm. fascist and post-fascist, whatever. So they're trying to work out all these things on Rilke's body here. And then um, then more recently, there's a kind of, po let's say, post-modern turn and it's language for its own sake, mm -hmm. which I do not believe poetry is. That's not interesting to me to read it like this. And I say language which touches itself or language about itself, they all become meta poems. Mm -hmm. And I don't think they actually be a meta poem. So there's the kind of history of local criticism. Mm, that's right. So. Well, um, in terms of, um, I, I liked your book because it it, it uh, kind of saves uh, Rilke from from um, from a, a, what seems to be from the very beginning a kind of a new age. Uh, <laughs> Rilke, uh, in, in terms of translation, I, I think I'm, I'm right. The most 
widely foreign poets in terms of number of editions in America are Rilke and Rumi. That's right. Mm. Uh, so it's Rumi Nation. Um, That's right, Rumi and, Nation. <laughs> and uh, Rilke, Rilke is right up there in terms of, uh, in terms of um, this kind of new agey self-help, uh, yeah. spiritualizing. Um, and I, I'm, so I'm, I, I, really, I really like the way that you kind of uh, mm -hmm. puncture or punctuate that by, by coming back to the alphabet. Um, I grew up on that Rilke with a uh, German grandmother who was a Steinerian anthroposophist and uh, uh, had all of the early little Insel Verlag uh, Rilke books, which uh, mm -hmm. which which um, you know had a had a kind of erratic um, immediacy to me, and uh, in a way Rilke. I'm not sure. I mean, Rilke is the last uh, the last poet to have uh, success totally successfully managed his career. I mean, those early Insel books were were made to be those were gift books. They were published just before Christmas. Uh, they were no, they were yes, yeah. um, incredible. How canny uh, Rilke and his publishers were, precisely about. Um, uh, making money mm -hmm. off of poetry, and then also making money in his way off off the last remnants of the patronage system. Mm -hmm. Right. And um, I mean, here's where I'm getting the the question is is that so already okay? And in, in in a very coarse way, you want to kind of get away from from the transcendental uh, uh, reading the readings of of history uh, of of Rilke going towards the transcendental and wanting to, him to uh, locate him really in the domain of the imminent, you know, in, right. in terms of Hielzein as Hallig. But uh, um, just reading through your book, listening to you, um, and you want to you want to argue against de uh, sublimation, and yet, and yet, this more, this more. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> Rilke's relation to surplus and poetry as part of a surplus economy, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. um, and being the last to live off the kind of surplus of patronage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, somehow, somehow that surplus, and, and even what you're doing with his individual words is mm -hmm. in fact um, working the surplus out of them. I mean, this is, this is, this is not a William Carlos Williams Dingedicht, uh, uh, these words that you're looking at, um, you're, you're working on their surplus values here. So, it's a, it's a question about sort of um, Rilke, Rilke and the surplus economy as, as opposed to what you may be somewhat disingenuously uh, uh, pitching as, you know. Uh, as a kind of imminence of. Yeah. Well, I'm, that, that's, that's while you're talking, I was thinking, okay, what, is this a kind of, is there a certain dishonesty in Rilke who's, as you're saying, completely living off this other economy and logic while he's insisting the here and now and all that and then occasionally yes he's really it's a moment where he talks about you know the ham on the table and the lemon slices like a sun sinking into the tea and all that and then he's like I can't live like this this is a country house and I don't have heat and it's it, there's a certain dishonesty let's say or is it actually an honesty in the sense that of course there's no more to life we are here and he does this very well when he tells these women that he loves them um, and they all fall in love. This is clear. He seduces them through language, which is one of the operative modes of his poems, actually. There's a kind of seductive element. So he's promising us something which we will never have, but we want to believe we can have it. It's credit. Well, <laughs> credit is one thing, but we want to believe, actually. We want to believe that, and sort of this kind of mutual, which in some ways, um, you know, good old... Harold Bloom wrote this to me. He said, like, you know, there's a kind of mutual deception. We want to be told that we're loved, and we want to believe that it's true, that they actually mean that. And when both of you actually agree to this deception, then you're in love. So there's something here that actually is staked on this, of course. There's a kind of, there's no grounding in this. There's no, you know, it's, it goes right back to Wilkin, and as you can point out, he's completely dishonest on some levels about this, or as Shane said, there's a kind of problem. It's not that this there's no ethical existence 
mapped out here at or all. Or where is the ethics, I guess? No, there's very little they ethics, don't exist, I think. Yeah. Um, Except on those moments when I said he was corrected by people and he actually mm -hmm. paid attention to people. And I also liked the fact that he wrote letters to anyone who wrote him a letter that he found interesting, he responded. From literally the teenage fan, you know, it's like to some super rich, mm -hmm. you know, person who would pay for his rent for the next couple of years. So there is a kind of, the, I'm playing with that, you're right. And then part of it is also, um, I am, you know, as new age as they come. So I don't have a real, I don't have a fundamental objection to that quest. I think the means are usually entirely corrupt and silly because they're just not true. It's like, you know, to pluck a little bit of Buddhism out of Asia and do this and that and meditate every once in a while to, and then yell at everybody in this kind of grounded way. You know, that's not the idea. But there is something that I think that there's ultimately something there. So I think you were pointing right at the, this is what this book is about. <laughs> You know, it's like, mm. yeah. I want to just pick up that on that and, and return to Gaspar Estampa. Um, and given that he's the one who, as I think you've suggested, is the one who's breaking off these affairs and who's, you know, falling in love with the next woman around the corner, you know, Stampa is someone who stays faithful for a while, not for her whole yes. life, you know, for yeah. most of her life to yeah. a single lover, even when he leaves her. Um, and, you know, you describe her, and Milker describes her as someone who makes her pain immortal through her language. You know, it's not her love that she makes immortal, it's her pain. Her pain yeah. uh, and then you also go on to suggest that Stampa is someone for whom there's no way back to life. So her poetry becomes so all-encompassing mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. she doesn't take that path to life, which I mm -hmm. think is where mm -hmm. you so persuasively mm -hmm. and, and, again, poetically suggest is, is really... Rilke's intention, right? Poetry is a way to life. It's not an escape from it. Does he envy Stampa? I mean, does he envy the Stampas who are able to just let go of, 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 of everything else, all the other distractions, and to throw themselves into something and, and leaving life behind? I'm well, you know, yeah, Stampa is Lo Louise Labbe, who Richard just translated. You translated Gaspar Stampa, so uh -huh. you lived with these We'll women. talk about those guys next week for so those of you who would like to which come Which will back. be great. Actually, you lived with these women for a long time, so you know how they are. You know, persistent, unrelenting, you know, writing this pain into their work which then becomes a substitute for life and mm -hmm. are they going back to life mm -hmm. and so I so Rilke says in the elegies you know which he completes in 1921 and 22 and he says have you remembered her sufficiently and he said like and I was like why well, doesn't know how to remember somebody enough sufficiently and I actually think he's asking a question there he said have I been honest yeah. about her hmm. sort of to really remember her means you leave her behind so this chapter is a very strange chapter because for the longest time I thought he really admires Stampa, mm -hmm. but then he has to go through her like another object, the way she goes through her lover, mm -hmm. you know, pass mm -hmm. through her. You cannot idolize this person who is living in pain ultimately. This is not a model for him because he actually lived his life. So there's a certain kind of callousness. Mm -hmm. He's also a man and he writes much early on, letters to a young poet, he said, oh, men, you know, we just blaze through this stuff. Women actually live through it, experience it. So. She is a role model maybe for writing poetry, mm -hmm. but he shies away from this idea that it becomes the substitute for life. At right. the same time, he has these moments as well. I mean, he lives in a little castle. And then, I mean, all these chapters are weirdly interconnected, I'm realizing right now. So he lives in this stone house, which he calls a tower, which is not a tower, it's just a stone house in Switzerland. <laughs> and then, so I'm sorry to say that, but then he's tortured because he's alone there all the time and he masturbates all the time. And we know this because he writes about this in his letters everywhere. And then, so I read those letters, and you're kind of thinking, oh, really, really? And there's a whole big MIT anthology called Solitary Sex, which omits Rilke. Good for him. Everybody else is in that book. <laughs> like, literally everyone else. And I was like, this is the man they couldn't find, you know? And, and, and it's not me reading some secret letters. It's in all the poems. He writes poems about them all the time. And then it connects to something else, which is this kind of mystery for him that these male monks commit themselves to loving Jesus Christ. And he said, for none I get that. That's totally understandable. You love Jesus Christ. But for a man, mm. what are you supposed to do with that love? How are you supposed to sublimate that? Because there's, physically, there's eros in that. So he has these kind of complex mm -hmm. ways of negotiating that. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's resolved. I think, yes, he admires her greatly, but he probably also turns her into someone she isn't. Well, right? there's that too. Right? Yeah. He says he keeps on, and you're saying, no, she actually gives up her love. Right she goes point. on to two more. Two more. Yeah. Okay. Good for her. Yeah. <laughs> you know, right. that's right. actually exactly. what Milken would have approved of. <laughs> <laughs> so they're more alike than he recognized. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yes. How about one yeah. last question? Yes. I just wanted to know how he moved on from his practicum with Rodin. Yeah. Was that through his poetry? 
poetry, and also it's ironic that he then falls in love with and then marries a sculptor. Mm -hmm. uh, right. I mean, he falls in love with her and marries her before, right? And they get divorced pretty quickly. He gets fired by Odown because he uses his letterhead and writes to a client of Odown. Odown's selling a huge amount of work at this point uh, to Americans mostly who come to Paris and have lots of money and buy sculptures, which are on all the college campuses in America. Um, <laughs> so he writes a letter to this one woman under his own name because he talked to her and he's a poet and he says, oh, I'm a poet, I'll write to you. And he, Odown finds out and is furious and says, you used my connection to write under your own name. Um, I'm going to fire you. And then Rilke writes this amazing letter to her and says, you, chase, you are chasing me from your home like a thieving servant. It's totally unjust. I did nothing wrong. We had a connection, and I just wrote her a letter, and I've already taken care of business, and you're selling her some stuff. But I'm in the way, and it's obstructing your view right now and distracting, so I'm leaving this afternoon. So he leaves right away, and then he says, and thank you for giving me my freedom to become an artist now. So, I mean, you know, if you've ever gotten fired, I wish someone had that capacity. Like within one sentence, he says, oh, you've given me my freedom to become an artist. So he becomes an artist immediately. He realizes, oh, Rodin was just this big sculptor in my way, actually, whereas mm -hmm. until the day before, Rodin was everything to him. Mm -hmm. So he moves on, and then later on, they meet again. And he says, oh, and Rodin says, oh, les shows, les shows, and they kind of become friendly again. And he finds that building today, that's the Musée Rodin in Paris, because Clara Wilke lives there, and she, rents, and she rents a room, and he says, you got to go see this amazing building. It's owned by the city of Paris. Well, now a very powerful artist at this point. He convinces the city of Paris to give it to him. But the Wilkes live there, being divorced. Clara has a studio there. Rilke, Reiner has a studio there. They, like, say good morning every day, and then they, he brings Rodin. He, this is where the Musée Rodin is today. So there's a very deep connection to this. Mm. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you. I really appreciate too. it. Thank you, Jane. Thank you. Thank you.